It's all about the gamer subs, gamer subs, it's a drink. And you can get 22% off with my code THORIN, T-H-O-R-I-N, because it's a delicious energy formula that can be purchased. And that same offer applies entirely store-wide. And did you know that 22% is not forever? Normally, the code only works for 10%. But if you go and go and use my code while stocks last or until 7 p.m. CET, 2 p.m. EST on the 9th of February. This isn't a real song. I made it up to tell you about gamer subs. I can make all of the words fit the melody. Right. Obviously, right now, as you can see on screen, we have a sale going for gamer subs where check the date that this video isn't two weeks old. And if it's still relevant, as long as it's not either the 9th of February, 2024, or Stocks haven't run out. You can use my code Thorin, T-H-O-R-I-N, and get 22% off anything on the Game of Stops store. So I would say check out some of the delicious flavors like citrus lemonade, guacamole game fight 9000, don't worry, it's strawberry and lime, Clyde's black cherry. Also, for my AMA here, if people don't know, you can submit questions for these on Discord if you have the appropriate level. Um, I obviously have my side channel going, so some of the questions, if you have a subscription there that are not esports, maybe put on the side channel AMA. Did you know, if you want to actually get a yearly subscription to my Patreon, you can actually now save 16% off that while getting all of the perks. Check out the site for that for a yearly subscription. And I actually now have activated, I haven't made a video yet, I've actually activated YouTube memberships. So if you want those people who, for whatever reason, just doesn't like Patreon, maybe you have some reason you don't want to support them, you don't like the interface, so you're just not comfortable with it, you can also sign up through YouTube and become a member of the Skrill Illuminati, get the appropriate perks like Ask Questions in AMAs. Hey, you can do it on Discord. Once you connect to your account and subscribe and become a member you'll see that it'll give you the appropriate role when you join my discord which is in the description box below and you can sub submit the questions there you can also do the donate discussions and have your name featured at the end of the video so there's many different ways you can support me you can buy gamer subs you can support me through patreon you can support me through youtube you can do all sorts of i've got stuff on my side channel so let's get into this one as always any old patrons that want to reach out to me you can ask a question of these two so i actually can't even pronounce this name it looks like a polish name Zabel, it's like S-Z-A-B-E-L, Zabel says, unless it's Hungarian, says, on a recent show, you mentioned Jedi Mind Tricks, A History of Violence, as a favorite album of yours. It was technically a favorite hip-hop album, but yes, or rap album. As a long-time listener of both their music and your shows, I'm curious if you also keep up with Vinny Paz and Just Allah's other side slash solo projects. And if so, which albums or tracks of those you enjoy the most? Personally, I enjoyed a lot of Paz's solo stuff like Season of the Assassin and God of the Serengeti. Some of the early features are insane. So... Yeah, here's the thing. I actually do think for Vinny Paz, I follow pretty much everything he does. Like I've heard all his side albums, I've heard a lot of the mixtape, he's done many of his features with other people actually. Um, so I would say, I would say the problem is I much prefer the Jedi Mind Trick stuff, like massively so. I actually do think his side stuff really early on was really spotty because it didn't have Stoops production. And I think he leveled up massively over the years, just as he did actually with his vocal and flow, etc. on Jedi Mind Tricks. I think he got way, 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 way better. And I've always wondered, if you look at when I think he got really good in his solo stuff, if actually doing that one um, album that was the one without Stoop as the producer, where they got all those other young producers and just Allah came back, etc. I've actually always wondered if getting those connections with other producers at that time who were kind of like the hot up and coming producers, sending him in beats and stuff, is actually how he got better production because his production on his side project seems way better since then. Uh, in, if it's not with Stoop, like... Army of the Pharaohs stuff, I think you just pick and choose tracks, don't you? There's some really good tracks there. There's some that are just whatever, completely forgettable. I actually think the best Vinnie Paz album is actually quite a recent one. It's the 2016 The Corner uh, Stone of the Corner Store. I thought that was a banger. Tracks like Herringbone. I mean, I think this is just like some of his best work. He's pretty much almost hit his zenith as a rapper. His material's fantastic. It can be lighthearted. It can be serious. It can be edgy. It can be sort of poetic and lyrical. 
Um, if you want to do specific Vinnie Paz tracks, uh, Cheese Sticks is obviously a banger. I mean, to be fair, I think I was even featured on Joe Rogan, so it's not really an obscure track, is it? End of Days, obviously, I love all the conspiracy stuff anyway. That's a straight fire banger. A lot of people don't know that because he doesn't go as hard on that stuff now, but especially that was actually part of the flavor of Vinnie Paz's stuff earlier on because he was reading like Velikovsky and stuff. He was reading all these super like out there fringe conspiracy theorist type people. Uh, and that's obviously a banger track for that sort of stuff. Uh, is happiness just a word? That track that's about sort of like um, like anxiety or depression or something. Slum chemist. I mean, some of these are off the albums this guy's mentioned. So I think these are all bangers. Can't go wrong with those. Um, there's also the one that's like, is it called Same Story or something? There's that track where, unfortunately, the original sample didn't get cleared. And so like it ruined it basically. But you can still get the actual, just look on YouTube. You'll find the track. This is what got to be one of the most poignant, moving songs ever. I mean, it's basically about Vinnie Paz's life, if you don't know. It's, just, it's actually incredible. The problem you have here is you then threw in Just Salah, right? I don't even count Just Salah as part of Jedi Mind Tricks. I, I actually despise Just Salah. I think his floor is trash. I think his actual substance is non-existent. I think he's just whack. To me, it's just smoke and mirrors. I don't know what anyone's getting out of this. Like, the joke is, when he came back and did that album, I skip his verses, mate. Ah, skip his verses. Like, I find him to be fucking garbage, personally. If you actually like this sort of music and you're looking for something related to it, I think the obvious sleeper that so many people don't seem to be aware of is actually all the material by the Lost Children of Babylon. Like, I did obviously a video on my side channel just about this. Barbara Stanwyck's Legs says, In your interview with Too Good in 2011 at IEM, he mentioned that one of the things that made Fatality special was his unshakable belief in himself. I would be interested to know of other competitors you have observed, in esports or otherwise, who have this quality and how it manifests itself. Right, the problem here is going to be this. I can tell you for the esports people, because some of these people I literally knew or know now and have talked to, many times about their competitive mindset, what they think about this, or should they have won that game, was it an upset, what, how, what form are they in, what level are they in, who's the best, who's actually winning all the scrims, etc. When it comes to the sports stars, I'm just going to have to guess, I'm just going to have to speculate, it may actually be the case they're putting on an act, or maybe they just know how to answer well in an interview, who knows, right? When it comes to esports people, the first person who immediately comes to mind is Cooler. Like, if people don't understand it, the reason why in Quake Live and Quake, Quake Champions, Cooler went from, when he was younger, he would trash talk and he would play mind games. But then later, he almost became, like, it looked like he would get frustrated. And then the way that would manifest was he would just be disrespectful to his opponent. And it wasn't that he was doing it to nobodies, which might be funny, like, <laughs> he is owning them. He would actually do it where he was almost doing an idra, where he's, like, blaming the other person for winning and how they played. And some of these were even not just rivals, but friends of his, people like Cypher and Rafa and Avec, he's found his own ways to have these little beefs with these people. And I think part of it was this guy, because he was so brilliant at Quake and so good at Quake, all versions of Quake, whenever he decided to put in the time and effort, I actually do think on some level, he sort of does feel like he's entitled to win. Like he, he should be the best when he's at his peak, when he does the right things, when he does the plan he's thought of. That's what, one of the things about Cooler that gives away to me this belief is think of all those times Rafa beat him, but they'd have very close games. It'd be overtime or right at the end of the game would be the last frag. Even against Rafa, who himself might actually be the best strategist ever in Quake history, Cooler would still do that thing where when there's like a minute left and he's a frag down, he would still do that thing where he'll leave it till 10 seconds left because he just sets up a trap he thinks will work and then executes the trap and by the way the amount of times he made it work against Rafa was bonkers or come close to working so it just showed to me this guy really did almost think like I'm some sort of like I mean you could almost say he's like one of those incredible chess players you hit like what, what's that guy called fucking Casablanca or whatever where People just say he was like unbelievable ability to just do whatever he wanted in chess, right? You just had an intuitive feel for it. So yeah, I've always thought Cooler's an obvious one. I've never thought Yachi was just being rude. It's more like that was frustration. Um, this is a weird one, but I actually think there's players who, <laughs> like obviously forgiven in League of Legends, was never close to the best player in the world. But I can tell you, not only at one point, I think mechanically was the best Western player, but he actually did have this insane mindset that he never really believed anyone was better than him. As in... 
even people like Uzi Ai or Wei Zhao, who was still really good in 2014, he not only would tell me when he played these people, yeah, I beat them, my God, you know, when they didn't have like the jungle help, I was able to defeat. He actually thought he should beat them. And by the way, that is extremely rare. I don't care what anyone's told you in interviews. There are very few Western players I ever actually believed really thought they should beat the top Asian player. Like that's why when they were at their peak, I did think perks, like perks were very incredible. Or someone like, um, I would even say someone like Wonder in his own way. I think some of these players, Mickey X, at times. Some of these players did actually believe it was possible to do it against anyone and that their level could be good enough. Forgiven was one of those rare examples and he was years before this, by the way, when no one was supposed to be able to beat the top, top Asians. They were winning everything. Um, I think this is obviously speculation for this one because I don't speak Korean and I haven't spoken to this guy outside of an interview. I think that Jadong, before Flash beat him in the HANA Day 2 Securities MSL, which is the one that, in my opinion, swung the whole rivalry and then made Flash just the unbeatable Bonjour force. Jadong, before that, when he'd beaten Flash in the near MSL and the 2009 run, and then the years coming up to 2007, 2008, I think he was the most clutch player ever in esports. And I think part of it was, I really do think from his practice and his skill set and his killer instinct, he just did not think he could be beaten. Every game he would just reset, he would destroy you. And I think actually, was the hardest mental to break at the time, even though actually, the irony is, I think the greatest player ever, Flash, eventually broke his mental fortitude. And that crack is why Jadong never won another tournament, in my opinion. Um, a couple of other esports people, the obvious one is Rafa. He doesn't give it off in interviews, this is what I mean. You actually probably wouldn't guess that. You probably wouldn't think it because he's such a reasonable person. In fact, the joke is, I think I've told this story before, after the final, I consider the best Quake match ever, the IEM for global final so that's the 20 early 2010 it'd be around like march of 2010 quick im final between cooler and rafa which rafa wins 4-1 uh, 3-1 uh, it's actually the one where the DM6 game is the one that he did the review with Carmack. That stupid ESL's taken off YouTube now because they don't give a fuck about esports history. They only care about making money today as a cynical company. Uh, hence why loads of their great VODs and finals are up like loads of that are cast in Counter-Strike. When he actually um, played that final, after that final, me and him, before I even got to interview him, basically just like talked for like 20 minutes as though we were fans of Cooler, about how cool Cooler's play in the final was and how back and forth it was and the amazing little tricks and moments of back and forth and tension and push and pull and all that. So this guy really loves Quake. So he, he will be someone who will give it up and say when someone else is better. And say when so but you have to understand, this guy went into every big final thinking it was possible to win, thinking there was a game plan to win. And that didn't matter if he was playing Peak Cypher, whose skills were impossible, if he was paying... Navek, who might have just absolutely knocked the fuck out of like Kula and Dahang and people. It didn't matter if he was playing against Dahang, who's played him a bunch of times in practice, or if he's playing against Kula himself, who's like the master. It didn't matter who he's playing. Kilson hit all the rails, spots. Whoever he was playing, this guy always thought he could win, always believed there was a way to win. And until the, the game is over and that clock, he still thought it was possible. I'm telling you, he had an amazing mentality in that sense. Like he has probably, I actually think, look, it's in Quake, so it's not like as many people playing, but. You could say Rafa's a contender for best competitive mindset ever in esports history. That's, in my opinion, the main reason he has won so many championships. It's not just skill and strategy. It's also the way he could keep his mind focused. He really did have that sort of Rudyard Kipling if poetry style. like, And then to treat both as... You know the premise I'm talking about, like the idea of like misfortune and then good times. Like it, This guy just had such a level head, it's crazy. It's actually why I think it's quite interesting that obviously in his personal life, he's very religious and Christian, isn't he? I wonder actually how that influences philosophically, how he approaches games and what he does in that sense. Would be an interesting thing to talk to him about, but obviously people ignore that aspect of his personality. Um, the other one for me, sports, I think is obviously simple. I knew, if you don't know, this is why this stupid beef online and him pretending he sort of doesn't know me and I'm just some kid and that he doesn't respect me, even though he'd already privately, by the way, after that apologised, I've literally got it recorded, he publicly has apologised to me in my reflections. The reason why that was so stupid is I've known this guy for fucking years and years, like, we're coming up on what, like, eight or nine years now of me knowing him even in real life, like, give me a break, but... I knew him when he uh, when Zewu got that first number one from HLTV. I knew I could ask him that question. He was going to say, of course, he's better. What he'll do is this. He might say, you deserve to win. You played great. You overall fit these criteria. But ultimately, no one's better than simple. And he knows that. And he's certain of that. And that's why he did say he could come back and be number one again, of course. he. I mean, he's put in infinite hours. His skill level seemingly uncappable. 
And he just keep getting better and better over the years. So it's like, actually, I think absolutely this guy believes he's the best ever to play any version of any game. I like he said he could be the best in any FPS game, which is like an outrageous statement, by the way. No one could be the best in every FPS game. But I can see why he believes it. Then in sports, I actually think there's loads. Some of the... Some way less obvious. Like, to me, a couple of tennis players that obviously fit this is actually not Federer. I do think Federer had, like, an arrogance and had a very strong belief in himself. But I do think after enough losses against Nadal and Djokovic, I do think, actually, it fucked with Federer. In the same way as once upon a time, I do think, actually, when he played people like Safin and Nalbandian, he did think it was possible to lose. And so he was on the sort of the edge when he was playing against these guys. In a way, he never was when he played Leighton Hewitt or Andy Murray, etc. He kind of knew he had him in his pocket. But I actually think the obvious two ones in tennis are Nadal and Djokovic because Nadal you just have to have some sort of unshakable belief to be able to dig in like this guy can like I've actually seen him in matches where the match is over like the joke is if you ever watched that 2011 French Open final that on the scoreboard looks like oh he wins it comfortably it's supposed to be over after like the first set basically like in the first set he's getting thrashed so much that's the end of a set for most people then you're probably gonna lose the next one now you're down two sets instead I mean Go back and watch the game. You'll see how he battles, but it's unbelievable. 2009 final. He's hit. He's literally returning like some of the greatest winner shots you've ever seen, just as a, a return, and then the game's still going. So Nadal has to have it. And then Djokovic, I actually think, developed it. That's the most interesting. I think he started with arrogance, and I think he started with skills, but I also do think he quit on himself. He quit on physically, mentally, spiritually. I think later on, though, you go to sort of like... I mean, obviously, there was the back and forth period where he lost a few in the middle right. But you go to like his 2015 onwards, I mean, that guy is unbeatable. That player is the player that today has like probably the greatest flaw of any player ever in a game. Incredibly hard to beat. You basically have to have him down and probably beat him early. If you let him get to a fifth set, no matter how the game's been going, no matter how many hours has been going, he's going to find a way. So I think he's got to be one. I mean, the joke with him is he was even willing to say... I don't care what external things you place and demand of me. I think I know better and I will say, fuck you, I won't do it. Um, in basketball, I think there's a bunch. Not all of them are as obvious. Like, yes, Michael Jordan. Yes, Kobe Bryant. I think Larry Bird is one that people might not understand because if you just watch the highlights, you have to listen to this guy talk. And you have to listen to the stories. He really did believe, essentially, you can't ever guard him. <coughs> if he takes a shot, your defense is what stops him. He just missed. He actually was that sort of a guy, so ultimate confidence. And I actually think another Celtic, no one ever talks about. I often, po I'll probably do a video on this one day on my side channel. I despise this nonsense where plebs tell on themselves by going, <laughs> Paul Pierce thinks he was better than Wade in a rival of LeBron. You didn't watch basketball, mate. I'm just telling you right now. Are you an idiot? You pick. Because Paul Pierce, by the way, first of all, used to outplay LeBron, especially in the clutch routinely, including in the playoffs, even in into LeBron's prime, by the way. And then secondly, by the way, Paul Pierce also has got given fucking D Wade the business over the years too, was mega even against people like Kobe. This guy was a monster, especially... The, I mean, the joke here is, the reason you don't think he's a monster is because he weren't watching in the 2000s. So you only know when he was in the team that could win the championship and almost won the two rings. That was basically the end of his prime. After that, then he's just winning off being clutch, which, by the way, he's still making shots. Lit. So I've always thought this guy, because he had such a unique skill set, it wasn't based around pure athleticism. It was based around using physical leverage, old man game, uh, being clutch, like faking someone, fainting them out, pump, pump faking, getting your shot off. This guy was really, he, it clearly seemed to me like he always thought he could make the last shot. Um, I actually think there's one from um, ice hockey that I would pick, which has got to be my favorite, Mario Lemieux. I mean, essentially, he looks and has the game of if you just went on one of those like hockey games and you just built a character and you just set everything OP as fuck, you make him giant, massive wingspan, insane skill and precision, tricks, can beat people one-on-one, -on -one, go around the goalie, score hard goals, score every type of goal. Like, this guy's ridiculous, mate. Pass. What are you talking about? Like, I mean... To me, it's only injuries that stop this guy being the goat of hockey. And then the last one, even though obviously I don't think he's the goat of MMA, I'll have to give it up to Habib because it comes from a cultural background with Dagestan and his father, a spiritual background that he's a very devout Muslim. And then the fact that he never lost, I do think actually that he really did believe he would beat every single person. Like, I don't buy this nonsense people tried to make up of Corp of like, oh, I just left because he's too much of a cat. No, I really believe, I actually believe earnestly his reasons for leaving. I also think it's a very, very hard sport and you don't want to keep going until you get knocked out, etc. So I actually do think that he's someone where he wasn't scared of fighting against 
fucking Conor McGregor in a rematch, or if he had to fight Islam, well, and obviously in theory he wouldn't. Like to me, this guy really did just quit because he didn't want to fight anymore. Just he had a situation going on in his real life, and it just changed his circumstances and his perspective, it took him out of that like tunnel he'd been on his whole life. <laughs> Stephen Dooley. As someone who only really follows pro CS, what would the CS scene look like if it became smaller, like the StarCraft scene? Do you see this downsizing happening anytime within the next five years? I don't think it'll actually downsize within the next five years because of the Saudi angle. I actually think that is sort of almost like an unlimited money pipeline that's being turned on now, as long as you're willing to do what is necessary or not say the things you're not allowed to say in order to access the money. So actually, I think that can probably pump. It might even get bigger. Who knows? While well, the other esports struggle, although I think they'll also become Saudi owned. So if we imagine this premise you give though, of like, what if it became like Starcraft? Two, presumably. Right, you'd obviously have fewer regional relevancies. Like, I imagine immediately, I mean, Asian CS was nothing anyway, but I think NACS would probably die off even further. Maybe a little bit of South American CS would die off. I mean, I think they still have as good players because they will play for less, but I, I actually think some of the big names might even retire the cold zeros of the world. Um, I think CIS... Counter-Strike will still be doing great because they can handle playing with less. I think some of the older, bigger names, that's actually one of the key things. I think a lot of big names who are just here for the money or big, big competition, like winning a giant major, yeah, if it becomes really small, maybe some of them just retire or they say, ah, it's shut down, so they leave. Especially if there were any pre-existing reasons or issues with the game. Like now, that's just going to be an easy decision make. It's going to be a deal breaker. It's not enough money, not enough opportunity, so fuck it, I'm out. So I actually think, to me, it will actually like thin the the herd, as it were, mainly of the people who aren't as necessary. Like, I actually think when you have a smaller scene, it becomes even more important to win. It becomes even more important to be on top. So as a result, whether it's financially, in terms of opportunities, in terms of job security, I think you'll just see less people do it, but the ones who do are the ones who are all in, who are committed. I mean, I've always said this. You just see that that raw salary and prize money doesn't motivate people. And the reason you know that is there are players to this day, I won't say the name, but there was a player who got an enormous salary a few years ago and he wasn't even doing the basic homework. Even worse, he was logging into the software and doing this thing where he could tick that he'd done the homework, but they, he didn't know there was like a timer and they could check that he'd only be on the site for one minute. And this guy was getting a huge salary. What a dickhead. Making literally like what he used to make in a year, if you were like Neo in 1.6, he was making that in a month and he couldn't even do his homework. Like, Fuck that noise. So I actually think the great players, like the Get Rights of the World used to grind to oblivion when you really did make $18,000 a year from playing Counter-Strike. Like, that's just the level this guy's on. So I think you'd also see who loves the game, who's really here for the important reasons, right? I think, um, sadly... It will mean we have to emphasize the Saudi angle more because the scene's going to get smaller and then anyone with money will then be massively valued. And I actually do think this could also make... Um rosters in some ways more ruthless on one level if you're just a canny roster like a heroic or an end so you could just stick together as friends because not as big a deal but at the same time i think the very competitive players it would be more like ti in um dota i think because of the sticker money you might just see teams breaking up every time they don't win the major and reformulating a new super team to try and get the sticker money from the next one or the money from the prize money of the major at the next one so i think it'd be more something like that it would it would sort of focus it would trim the fat and it would make it more about the love of the game than the love of money and if people don't know i've mentioned this before but it's one of my pet peeves you know when people go ha money is the root of all evil says the bible it doesn't say that it says that the love of money is the root of all evil and i think the distinction is very key and worth pondering <laughs> Nia Ken says, I'm thinking about trying different types of alcohol, like a whiskey or a scotch. Do you have any suggestions or recommendations for where to start? Now, I don't know if that's just because people think I am Scottish, especially if they're American and they can't like sort of place the accent, which I don't blame you, it's a northern accent, it's below Scotland, but I'm, I'm actually not in the traditional sense, Scottish. I actually am part Scottish, so there is a bit of that. But believe it or not, this isn't my thing. Like, I don't know how much you follow my content, but I'm not really an alcohol guy. I'm obviously more of a weed smoker if people don't know. So it's not my thing, I'm afraid. And especially whiskey and scotch, even though I drink alcohol, not the ones I drink. I think they taste disgusting, I'm afraid. Like, the joke is the only time I'd ever drink one of those is I might just have, like, you know, Southern Comfort and Coke, but that's not supposed to be whiskey, really, is it? Like, I'm not really going hard there. I'm, I'm doing it specifically because it doesn't taste strong and burny, etc. That's actually a question, by the way, more for someone like Richard Lewis, who's just I mean, a known alcohol drinker and obviously likes loads of whiskeys. Monty actually has very good taste in general in life. I believe he knows loads of like straight fire Japanese whiskeys, etc. If I drink alcohol, I'm drinking either just for pleasure, like an amaretto sour, but properly made with the egg white form, etc. I think that's delicious. Or if I'm just going to drink 
casually, which I don't do that often at home. It'd be something like pear cider. It's a big thing in the UK. I think those pear ciders that are very sweet are delicious brothers. Uh, I mean, even the ones from Scandinavia, Copperberg, etc. Uh, if we're going with other British ones, Old Mout. These, these are all bangers, in my opinion. Matt Pugnaccio Racula says, I'm curious why and how you got into Dota 2 esports. As an LOL player, I dropped Dota 2 super early. What made it interesting to watch the TI each year? And how much did you need to know the abilities to watch slash keep up? Right, the key thing is, I just watch Dota as my fun game. I don't really work in the game. I want to have a game that I don't really work in. I occasionally do the odd piece, but that's almost as a fan. And I just want to be able to enjoy it like a fan, like everyone else can. I don't want to know all the things I know, well, sadly, than you do in esports, but to some degree less so. I want to just be able to watch it instead of engaging the way I would in the ones I cover. So first of all, just being around the esports scene, I was always aware of it. Like if people don't know, I've told the story before. If I go back to like 2005 or something, Everyone who's a Counter-Strike player or a Quake player or a StarCraft player or a Warcraft player or just works in esports, for funsies, when they're not playing those hardcore games, which they were perceived as, they played something like Dota as like a fun, almost like people who play Among Us during the online period, just as a fun thing you do with friends. And it doesn't matter if you're bad, it doesn't matter if the game breaks. You just do it for fun. So it wasn't viewed as a serious game. But then I saw there's a circuit developing and there's some legendary players and whoa, what's that? There's these amazing Chinese players who play, etc. So just like League of Legends, the circuit got me interested. I'm into hardcore games. I'm not really someone who likes games like Morbus. Really. They're, they're kind of noobs, noob games for me, even Dota. But I saw this is one of the more hardcore ones. I saw it had this cool circuit. TI actually I think has the best format. It's basically the IPL5 format. People don't think it has the best world championship format you can have. That's why it's the best tournament in esports and always has been. Obviously, I got into the elite teams. If people don't know, China had way more success in this game than they did in League of Legends. It took a long time until in League of Legends they got going. In Dota 2, they were one of the they basically were the Koreans because they weren't properly Koreans. They were the Koreans of Dota 2. So that was sick. But then you had a quite a good balance with the best Western teams. It was more comparable to like 2019 in League when you had G2, but they could battle against the best Koreans and uh, LPL teams. You would have Mitch nationality rosters, which at a time were very rare in Counter-Strike. You would have these essentially Western super teams of NA and European players that just were like really interesting mixes. I also always found it interesting that while you can hard carry in Dota, there's also that whole component where the roles actually are less defined in the league, especially in terms of what hero or character you pick. Like you can pick heroes in almost any role as long as you know what you're doing with it. And that's a specialty of yours. You can also obviously switch up the roles way more. Like you can have the off lane and be a greedy farmer. You can have one of the support just cheat and play like no items at all so everyone else gets all the gold funded you can do everything in this game that's one thing I think is quite cool actually is that the game doesn't tell you how to play you sort of choose from a palette how you're going to paint your canvas as it were and also I just don't like the league approach of like some stuff's OP then nerfed into the ground the daughter approach is loads of stuff's OP you figure out how to counter something OP that's my philosophy because I like the players to decide how to play the game not some idiot game dev I would just say for that in terms of the, like, the abilities thing, yeah, that's the biggest problem is I've never played Dota enough to be like an expert about the abilities and that sort of thing. But you just watch the game and you, you will learn patterns. So you'll know who's playing well and who's not. You, you've got, by the way, it's probably the best game for analysts and space for analysts. So they'll, they'll explain to you a lot of things going on. And essentially, you just learn the key things like, oh, wow, that was the BKB. Oh, wait, this is the big CC. Did. Oh, my God, if they don't do this, they're not going to get this Roshan. Oh, wait, he's playing Rat Dota on the sideline. Like, you'll just learn the basic concepts. It's like anything. You're not going to, you couldn't just come in and never have read any serious novels and then someone just hand you like Dostoevsky and read it and go, oh, it's fantastic. You wouldn't be able to get into it. You wouldn't be able to appreciate it. Even the style of the novel, the structure of it, some of the things they discuss. Maybe you're not even good at reading. You get the premise. So you have to level up a bit in order to really enjoy this. It's one of those things where you got to develop your palate. And I actually think to watch, I think it's way better than League of Legends personally. Frisky says, recently, thanks to Richard's recommendation and being a big fan of The Wire, I watched Homicide, Life on the Street. For its time, it's an incredible piece of introspective television, and I think I could make arguments about it being one of, if not the best drama of the 1990s. Brackets, yes, Sopranos started in the 90s, but I mostly mean shows that ran mostly in the 90s. 
With it being such a forgotten and underappreciated show, I wondered. I was wondering if there are some more unknown or forgotten TV series that you've heavily enjoyed and want to recommend. It could be anime as well, since I have never heard of Legend of Galactic Heroes until you mentioned it. Right, I've got a few here. This is also sort of side channel stuff. It's okay, we can blow it. I'll do more serious video when I do it on my side channel. Right, immediately to the top of the dome, I'm thinking Farscape, if people have never seen that one. If you like sci-fi in any context, movies, TV shows, this is one of the best ever. And it actually does that thing that stuff like Star Trek is terrible for. The alien creatures actually feel alien. They have alien morality, alien history, alien minds, alien perspective, alien bodies. They're not all just humanoids who are quite similar to humans. And then bizarrely seem almost a bit similar to certain races or historical cultures in humanity, which then provides a simple archetype for you to interact. Now, you get the premise. You get the premise. Like, I actually think this is one that actually grasps. I mean, I guess people are going to draw in the modern day comparisons like the I think this is way better, and some of the performances are mega in this, and just really interesting. Also, it runs many, many seasons and finds many ways to reinvent itself. Um, since a lot of people enjoy Black Mirror, I mean, I actually think it's gotten worse and worse, especially when it became American. The actual series that blows my mind is, if you don't know, Black Mirror essentially is just a modern day, the Twilight Zone or Outer Limits, isn't it? Well, the actual series that really does the true homage to that, in my opinion, and is a brilliant anthology of different stories that are totally unconnected by different directors, etc., the banger is the one called Philip K. Dick's Electric Dreams. I think it was an Amazon show. Basically, this one is mega. It's got some, first of all, it's got some really famous actors in. And then secondly, some of these episodes are just really good. Really good. Like, first of all, I'll just give you one immediately to check out. Go check out the one that stars like, um, I think it's called Terrence Howard, that black actor who was in the first, wasn't he actually like the first, guy before Don Cheadle to be the that character in like Iron Man I forget if he actually was in the first one or if I'm thinking of him being the second one but anyway that guy and um Anna Paquin or whatever and the one from X-Men they basically are in a one where they put on these like devices and you sort of go into almost like a matrix that just watch that one that is a fucking that that could be a movie mate that's mega this, this series is a bagger the one with the guy Brian Cranston with an alien aspect again what a fucking mega one off this is like there's some really really good ones on this one some really memorable ones too um, there was a series uh, people might know I like practical physical effects more than special effects and one of the best ever for this was a show called The Star Storyteller. It was a Jim Henson production. It is so dark. It's very much like European fairy tale style. It's so dark. It's so like. But here's the thing: it makes you feel like a Terry Gilliam film. You're in that world. You're not just imagining. You're not. It's not just dreamlike. You're in this world. You're encountering strange beasts and and fantastical aspects and and weird, creepy things and things that are dark that are off in the woods somewhere and things are unfair or good people don't always succeed. But then there's at the same time there's a sense of like cosmic giggle of like there is sort of a a, a happenstance that seems to occur in the way that it should so that bad people get what they should do and good people maybe get away with it. This it's It's got a really interesting sort of grey morality to it as well, I would say. A lot of people love Sherlock Holmes and detective procedurals, right? I'll say this till the end of time. The best detective procedural ever is probably Poirot. The original Poirot with David Suchet. Now, towards the end, they did get mega wanky because they're getting all these massive actors and they did sort of start writing stories that I imagine maybe weren't written by her because some of them got way too complicated. But the first ones are really good. It's just one of the best ones at really presenting a way that like everyone could have done the murder and they all have their own reasons and you try to guess between them. But then it's always a very clever but quite well reasoned out way that the murder was done and he just has really interesting idiosyncrasies and that's just a fantastic performance by David Suchet, isn't it? Um, since a lot of people have seen the Dune films and either like the David Lynch one for the aesthetics or the Villeneuve one because they like that massive new graphics, I actually think the one that captures the essence of the book the best is one by the Sci-Fi Channel. There was a mini series called Dune, I think it's a three-parter in 2000, and they did a three-parter uh, which also covered... Let me think, actually. I think Dune actually was just the first. And then what they did is they did one in 2003 called Children of Dune, which I think was the one that, like, combines Dune Messiah, the second book, and Children of Dune. Now, it's already been said that apparently they won't go past Dune Messiah in the films. I mean, I understand why. Children of Dune already pops off. That's the one where you have, like, spoiler, Baron Harkonnen comes back, but as a character in the mind of I, I, the sister of his, who's obviously herself, like, quiz at Hadrax out like a motherfucker. And so it's just a really interesting... I mean, I actually think the set design, 
lines and the costumes and some of the performances actually got some pretty big actors in there, if you, James McAvoy, etc. So I actually think that those are mad underrated. They're mad slept on. If you like um, some less serious stuff, obviously I'll give you some comedy since if you're American, you just won't know some of this stuff. Like, for example, if you like um, Simon Pegg comedies, like Shaun of the Dead, etc., The End of the World or whatever that one's called, then... The one to check out is the same director, Edgar Wright, made a series called Spaced with Sean Pegg in the 90s. It's straight fire. It's just mega if you're into sort of nerd culture from that time. Similarly, I've mentioned some of these before, but I'll do the old recommendation again. Garth Marenghi's Dark Place is like a satire slash comedy of 80s horror and silly TV shows. Uh, I love all the Chris Morris sort of politically tinged comedy, like The Day to Day, uh, Brass Eye. Uh, I was actually a massive fan just for the frivolity of This Morning with Richard, not Judy, which was obviously um, Herring, Richard Herring, doing all his good stuff. Uh, who else am I going to go with? I can't say I'd recommend these if you're sober and an adult now in 2024, but if you enjoy getting high, let's say, I actually think the 90s animated series of X-Men and Spider-Man are bangers. Like, they're really com true to the comics. They're actually fairly adult in the themes. It's just some of the, maybe some of the animation's a bit cheap, but you can tell where they just paid someone to make the same button get pressed four times instead of pressing it. But that's not the end of the world. You get into the story. I think it's actually really true. If you're a comics fan, you're going to really enjoy this. You're going to be shocked how good it is, actually, especially the X-Men one. They cover so many of the arcs. And then, since you mentioned anime, I won't give you much, but I'll just give you one where if you just haven't watched any big anime, have you only seen Miyazaki movies or Ghost in the Shell? The one to watch is there's a series that's Satoshi Kon, the guy who did Paprika and Tokyo Godfathers and Millennium Actress, Millennium Actress permanently slept on. It's Obviously, the series is Paranoid Age, and just an extremely unique TV series, anime style, that I won't even describe because it's just so out there. It's very psychological in some ways. So, yeah, there we go. There's some for you to check out. Toucan. How would you rate the legacy and career of Core JJ in light of how underwhelming his results have been in the last couple of years? Right. So in terms of his legacy and his career, I would have to say it's quite weird because I think the point where he was in ADC, he wasn't that relevant to me, even though he was still playing in Korea and he's all the all the sort of jazz. He was in the LCK. Obviously, switching to support is when I actually think the meaningful part of his career begins. Now, he wins Worlds, but it's like the best support in the world, in my opinion. It's just a good support. And he was with Ruler, to be fair, which has aged well in, in light of what's gone on since. So he won Worlds, but not like the best player. Then he came over, and that was also the ardent sense of what, if people remember. And then he came to LCS, and I do think he revolutionized the LCS. He did for support what Rainover did for Jungle, where everyone behind the scenes says this guy was a genius. We were all copying him. He was way ahead of us all. We couldn't do anything. We had to just learn from him, basically. He leveled us all up. Like, I'm actually going to investigate what happened to his individual form, because he does have this insane rep. Like, they do, like, call him these crazy genius nicknames and think he just did stuff no one could ever think of, and his ability to, like, gank top lane, for example, was so bizarre. He's also a very diligent player, guy who seems to like put in the hours, always grinds, always tries to help other people, tries to set up proper games, etc. I do think that his, his skill set has degraded somewhat, his game's changed a little bit, and he's picked some bad teammates, in my opinion, or vouched for them, or stuck with them. I actually think these last few team liquid lineups have been kind of a travesty. So, my problem is, like, if we're asking, is he one of the greatest support players of all time? The problem is there's a lot of really great players on that one. We've got Mata and we've got Ming and Mako and we've got Gorilla and we've got... You keep going down the list, right? There's so many. There's so many. There's so many you have to consider. So I feel like off the top of my head, he's maybe at the bottom of like a top 10 supports of all time list. But then again, also playing in LCS. It really great if you want to get to the top of those lists, is it? Probably should have gone back to Korea and played a couple of years in Korea and played with some stud like Aiming or fucking Viper or something. And then maybe you could have won even more championships. Justin Reed, what top lane player would you recommend watching to learn the role? Right, I'm not an expert in the specific roles, especially not top lane. So I would just say that's probably a really good question to ask Dom, actually, if you're a sub since he's actually been learning top lane, and I've, actually I've already seen his level of knowledge up. I would say to learn from two different types of top laner, and then you'll actually have like a well-rounded game. You want to look at people who are strong laners, so like Prime, Alfari, uh, Wonder before 2021, Khan, when he was on any of his best teams, and they actually gave him carry potential. These people are going to be phenomenal laners. Solo killing, up in CS, good in the matchup, then you also want people, though, because this is essential, in my opinion, in top lane, is you've got to also be good at being useful 
even if you don't get ahead, or in fact, you're put behind in lane. So I actually think like 369 did a masterclass of that when the team would play for the other side of the map. I think, um, and was godlike in team fights. Impact is probably the best Western example if you're thinking of Western teams. Oduamne has always been really, it doesn't matter if he goes down some kills. Soaz after 2015 when he wasn't really as much of a carry threat and he would play the dog champion. These are people where like, you can't stop these guys being relevant in the game. They're going to be able to use their decision making and what items and CS they do have in the team fights to do something and at least make you have to answer the call, as it were. Eddie Nahoy says, what would you consider the 10 best matches of StarCraft? Now, the only problem here is you just said StarCraft. I take StarCraft to mean Brood War. If you meant StarCraft 2, say that and make a way to do StarCraft 2. So if we're going to go off Brood War, it's actually a good question for a separate video, so maybe I'll do it. I'm, I know I've said in the past I'm going to do those ones. They come when they're ready, okay? So you'll see. They'll be I'm coming for Quake soon. I'll just do 10 off the top of the dome. Spoiler, a lot of them are going to feature Flash because I also think he was the best player ever. So I'm going to go immediately with the Nate MSL, that one at the beginning of 2010 between Flash and Jadong. This is the one where there's the power outage that tilts Flash and then it doesn't end the series under normal circumstances. Now, here's the reason that is such a travesty because this was actually going to be the most impressive win of Jadong's career. He did win this final, but... The games he is winning, and from the circumstances he is winning, it is impossible. I don't know how he is doing it in some of these matches. Um, Bisu and, and Flash was already about to go full god mode. Bisu versus Jadong, the GOM classic special match where you had the winner of Season 1, Jadong, play the winner of Season 2, which was Bisu. Obviously, historically, Zerg's supposed to be favoured over Protoss, except Pro Bisu is not just the best Protoss, he's the Protoss who's the best against Zerg and pioneered all the Zerg builds. So this is just a... It, it, look, we all know Game 5 was a, a balls, a blue balls fucking tease, but the others are exactly what you want from this match. And I wish this match could have been an MSL or an OSL final with the, like, the proper stakes and the proper stage set up. Um, Flash versus Bisu in the Pro League final ace match in 2012. This was the one where, if you don't know, even when he wasn't as good in the individual leagues going deep, Bisu was always unbelievable in the team leagues. Every year he would bounce back and have a run, and he was one of the only players who really could beat Flash. Now, listen, Protoss is supposed to be the one that has the chance against Terran, but man, did he put it on this guy. Remember, Flash was incredible against Protoss, but he just used to take care of them every time in the OSLs and MSLs. So I think this is one of the epic wins of all time. Obviously, one team won the championship. Um, another Flash versus Bisu, which is that World Cyber Games 2009 one. As soon as I mention it, if you've ever watched it, you'll immediately know. You might think, what, World Cyber Games? No, no, Korean qualifier. And the reason why I bring that up is this is the one where you have two of the best examples of micro simultaneously in the same match go head to head because you have Flash doing this insane vulture micro, putting the minds down. And then Bisu does that ridiculous Dragoon control where you would literally think Dragoons have easy pathing and control when you watch him play because he's just popping every mine up and blowing it up before it hits him. It's insane how well they both micro in this one fight. Then I'm going to go with, uh, we're going to go way back in time now, Reach versus I Love Oove from the ever 2004 OSL semi-final. This was when I Love Oove was dominating Brood War with his macro, and Reach was the macro Protoss that said, hey, I'll take you on head to head. And this was fucking epic. This is an epic, epic match. Another one has got to be July so July Zerg versus Isle of Oove in the Gillette OSL semi-final. I think that one's also 2004, but it could be 2000, early 2005. I think it was 2004. No, it could be 2005. This was when, um, I think it was 2005 actually. This is when Isle of Oove had had that insane TVZ streak. Did he go 22, 27 in a row or something? And not long after that, July Zerg comes along. Remember, Terran's supposed to be favoured against Zerg and fucking claps him. But in a really great match. I love who just beat people. He would just dance around people. This is one. It's not like when later on they have other matches. This is one where it's a mega close get. But he claps him in the sense that he can actually just straight up beat him. He can mechanically beat him. He can actually stop his plans. It just makes it such a thrilling match. It's a really, really tense one, this one. Um, 
Flash versus Stork in the GOM Invitationals. That was the final of the Invitational season, the first season, essentially, but not season one, because that was the one before they played in the OSL final where Flash baited him using all these, like, revolutionary TVP builds. It's a really close series. And then after that, they played in the OSL. Flash didn't do any of that shit. He pretended he was going to, and they just won the fastest final ever, 3 0 him. Um, Effort versus Flash in the Korean Air OSL season one final. This is the one where Effort shows one of the highest levels of ZVT you'll ever see. Like, he actually wins, essentially, four games against Flash even the only T3 because when it gets restarted like Flash is trying that like super fucking cheater go straight into the um command center approach which when he later pioneered like actually mastered made him unbeatable and even Jadon couldn't stop him but this is when there's still tiny cracks in it and if you have the mechanics of someone like Effort and the balls you can actually punish him and what a thrilling final this is remember this was supposed to be Flash becoming the Bonjour and it kind of delayed it by what like a week or something right um Flash versus J-Dong at the Real World Cyber Games in 2010 in the semi-final. It's the game that famously is a bit lagged on YouTube and was cast by Apollo and Rave or whatever when he was a little bit of a noob was Apollo then. He wasn't as, as knowledgeable about StarCraft. It's not a great cast in that sense, but it's an amazing series. It's only best of three, but it's unbelievable how good this one is. These are like epic macro wars. And then lastly, I'm going to do Flash versus Fantasy from the semi-final of the Big File Emerson. So I think I was, I think I was 2010. Uh, it's a TVT masterpiece. If you know TVT is kind of the real chess match of Brood War, it's not always the most enjoyable to watch, just like chess isn't super exciting always. This is just a chess match, though. This is just brilliant mind, a brilliant mind, and you can imagine all the things you can do with tank warfare, and they go to the absolute limit on this series. Fantasy really takes him to the limit, but Fantasy is not Flash, so he's not able to beat him. Right, as I mentioned, obviously the game is up, sale is going on, you can save 22%, up to... 7 p.m. CET on the 9th of February 2024 or when stocks run out. So I would go and check out all the stuff there. Maybe try out some flavors like citrus lemonade. Obviously, you can submit questions for the next one of these in the thread on Patreon or on my Discord in the channel. And if you subscribed via YouTube, make sure you, you connect your Discord to YouTube. And then as a result, you'll be able to go there and you'll make you get the channel. If not, contact the mods. Hey guys, what's up? This is Leaf from Complexity, and you're watching the Esports Historian Thorns YouTube channel. I've had to make a lot of tough choices in my career, but thanks to the support of my Patreon community, the Skrilluminati, I never have to make tough financial decisions. So this video and all the rest on my channel are kindly supported by Ahmed Haju, Frisky, Mac Pugnaccio Rakula, Animosity, Jensen Gore, Tobias Berners-Gorney, Tosh, Toucan, and you know it if you've ever heard before, and you'll hear it many times in the future. A special thanks goes out to my main man, Jerry Kizminian. Do you want to ask a question in my video AMA? Do you want to be part of one of those long discussions where we talk about whatever you like in esports? Do you want teasers? Find out who the upcoming guests are going to be? Or maybe you want to suggest a topic for a future Thorin's Thoughts type video? Well, if any of these perks or others appeal to you, put your money where your mouth is today and join the Skrilluminati by joining the Patreon link in the description box below.